Okay, uh, my name is Robert Hudzik, and I'm sitting here in the home of my uncle, Howard Arthur, in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, uncle Art, uh, what was life like in Portsmouth when you were growing up? Well, it was a very industrial little city. We had a, a big inland of Norfolk and Western Railway uh, yards, and it was one of the larger in the state. We had uh, at least two shoe factories, the Williams Manufacturing Company and the Selby Shoe Company. There was uh, Irving uh, last shoe, la made last for the shoes. We had a fine downtown with uh, a major department store and a lot of smaller. All of the storefronts were occupied on our main streets. Um, so what did you like to do as a child growing up? As I was growing up? Yeah. I was what was, uh, okay, a little bit louder, okay. <laughs> I was grow known as a river rat. When I was a kid, <laughs> we lived uh, within a couple of blocks of the river, <clears throat> and uh, my father worked in uh, one of the shoe factories, Selby Shoe Factory, and he also was a minister, a Baptist minister. And uh, when I was a kid, I loved dogs. I had a dog, and he was my companion. We were around the river a whole lot. I used to work, this is when circuses used to come to town, on the railroad. And uh, I used to work my way in, so to speak. Uh, a lot of the kids at the time would apply for a free pass to the circus. So we would help them with whatever we could. And there was a lot of them stumbling over each other because they, and they knew this, but this is something that they were uh, helping the kids get their passes. Uh -huh. So the uh, <clears throat> several circuses, we had probably three in the summer that would come. This is one of the things I did as a young kid. And uh, I enjoyed the circuses, which also included a lot of wild animals that I enjoyed very much. I've always been interested in animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember many enjoyable, not only the circuses, but the street fairs. Now, I didn't work at the street fairs. There wasn't anything for children to do at there, but uh, the uh, <clears throat> adults, that was an adult thing. And we went around and just watched at the street fairs. Um, so were you interested, I know you've told me that you were interested in writing and reading and in particular in ge geography. Uh, how did that affect your life growing up? Well, uh, I didn't get to travel much. At that time, people weren't traveling when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father, however, came from here and took <clears throat> his family down in North Carolina in a very vintage, uh, at that time, uh, I think it was a Model T, as before the Model A's came out. Uh -huh. And I don't remember that, but I have pictures of it. It was taken with the car, and but that was my extent of my traveling. And well, what, what about um, right after you graduated? Uh, you were telling me that uh, you were sort of a carefree individual and wanted to to see the country. I uh, after I got out of uh, high school. <clears throat> I had no 
means of going on to further education. It was just a few affluent people that were able to take her, send her kids to college. Was that something that you had wanted to do, go to college? Not necessarily. Uh, you see today, it's like sports. Mm -hmm. uh, up until television, we were limited to uh, what we saw maybe in a newsreel, in right. a movie, uh -huh. a sport of sports. Now, we had uh, a foot professional football team here, the Portsmouth Spartans. Eventually, they ended up, I believe it was the Detroit Lions. They went from here, and that's how they were formed. Mm -hmm. But I remember the stadium. I remember how they played, but I was at an age that I still didn't go in and watch the football games there. Well, now, excuse me. What about your travels, though? You said you had told <laughs> me you were you went to both coasts. Um, this is before well, the war. I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I think it was about a year uh, after I graduated. Uh, some of the friends of mine, uh, a little bit older, but well, what year would this have been? I graduated in 1940. Okay. PHS, okay. Portsmouth High School, and uh, people were looking for work mm -hmm. at that time. This was still in the Depression area. This was before the war, and that's when the change came up. So they have a 1928 Whippet. Now that sounds like a real old one, but back then it didn't have too many years on it. I mean, but I don't know who owned it, but there were five of us went to Baltimore, Maryland to get work. It was the word got around they were hiring in Baltimore and probably Cleveland or where else. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went over through the, uh, the Pennsylvania Turnpike wasn't in then. So we went on a route below the Pennsylvania border through Maryland and probably West Virginia, whatever states were hit, heading for mm -hmm. Baltimore. So uh, on the way over, we had to go over some high uh, hills with the car. The first night we were on the way over, we were going up one of those hills and the car stopped. So they couldn't get it started, so we all set in. I might say that five of us in that car, two up front and three in back, and what pieces of luggage we took was strapped onto the back of the car. <laughs> so uh, we slept in the car, just sitting still. Mm -hmm. Next morning, they started the car up. Just It perked up and started, and then we went on our... <sighs> so when we ended up over in Washington, D.C., and we went through Washington, D.C., and Annapolis, Maryland, our car was covered with tar from the roads that was we've gone over, and uh, we were a sorry sight. So you did you find work there then? Uh, I worked at the Marietta Silo concrete plant. Okay. Uh, they had make pieces silos made in pieces which fitted together, and they were a pretty big concern. Now at this time, they were making joists for housing projects, which is long beams for the support, uh -huh. and they were uh, steel reinforced concrete. And that's what we were on Chesapeake Bay. I was able to see the working three shifts, changing shifts. Mm -hmm. I was able to see the sun come up on the Chesapeake Bay every morning, which is when I was on night turn. Uh -huh. I had. Uh, we ate our meal at three o'clock in the morning. That was our noon meal. Well, but uh, how did you uh, how did you uh, find yourself in the army? In the army? Yeah. How did you how did that come about? Well, I was in like I say in uh, Dayton, working at the Buckeye Iron and Brass. Uh, I was young. 
and I my employment was shifted. I've worked in a lot of different. I've trucked freight in the freight depot in uh, NW when I was in this period of time prior to going into service. But uh, I was in Dayton. I uh, went to a movie. I worked at the Buckeye Arn and Brass, <clears throat> and I went to a movie one day and evening. And I sat in the balcony, and while I was there, a couple came in, sat down in front of me, right in front of me, and they had a newspaper. And it happened to be an extra. Those days when something happened, there were extras were on the streets, and boys hollering extra, extra, and all this sort of thing. So on the front page was uh, Pearl Harbor hit. So that's when I knew Pearl Harbor was hit. I bought a couple of papers and went back to my little apartment and read them. And now I knew that we were going into war. So eventually I came back to Portsmouth very shortly. That was in 1941. And in the time being, I worked at the Selby Shoe Company for a little while. My father worked there. So at the time I went into service, which was in uh, 42, Can you be? I worked at this uh, shoe factory. Were you drafted or did you? No, I volunteered. Okay. Yeah. Now how old would you have been at that point? Well, I would have probably been uh, 20 years old. 20 years old. Uh, let's see, I graduated in 40, and uh, so I was 18 at that time, yeah. so that would have been just about. So, so the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor is what spurred you into uh, enlisting? I knew that we were going in, and I was, I might go back a little bit and tell you that I spent two summers when I was in high school, a month every summer for 39 and 40. Uh, yeah, 39 and 40, at the Citizens Military Training Center, CMTC, which was popular at that time. This is the time of three C's. Oh, yes. Uh, your father mm -hmm. was in the three C's for a while there. Mm -hmm. uh, Citizens Military Training Camp. And we were, that was at uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison in uh, Indiana, near uh, Indianapolis. It was later known as Atterbury, Camp Atterbury. So I had my military training with the regular army people there. They trained us young ones in infantry. And uh, <clears throat> I never owned a gun in my life. I never owned a weapon. <laughs> but uh, somehow I liked soldiers. When I was a kid, very small kid, I had a little set of lead soldiers. And uh, I loved parades. I used to love to see the parade in the military, and I was always patriotic minded. And So uh, when you volunteered, where did they send you? Well, I was inducted. Uh, I went through the post office here in town. <clears throat> they had a bus. And I had to um, go to across the river to South Portsmouth and get to C and O Railroad. There were a group of us going in at the same time. I'd say uh, maybe six of us, volunteers. Mm -hmm. So we got to set our goodbyes at the post office in Portsmouth and got on the little railroad bus, which took passengers from Portsmouth over to South Shore. And uh, we went to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. And that's where I shedded my civilian clothes and for the next three years wore army uniform. <laughs> so where did they send you right off your first assignment? Uh, my first, for my basic training, was it down uh, <clears throat> in uh, Alabama, Fort McClellan. Alabama, and I took my basic training there. 
I finished my basic training and uh, they kept me there to train new cycles coming in. I knew my weapons and I knew my, uh, through my military training in high school, I had a, a little head start on them. Uh, I ended up with an expert bayonet and I it must have been fairly good because uh, <clears throat> we had a lot of, uh, there was three cycles of rookies come in. I think two were from North Carolina and one group from New York City. And we'd meet the train and bring them off the train and into the camp and they would go through the basic training cycle. <clears throat> And I received a corporal's rank at that time. Uh, there was also some uh, ROTC men came through, boys or men, whichever. <clears throat> they become men very quickly. Yeah. And uh, I trained them in the bayonet course. Oh, okay. That was the part of that. But, uh, I stayed there for uh, three cycles. They recommended me for officer's candidate school. I took a course in uh, preparatory for officer's training. <clears throat> From there I went to Camp Benning, Georgia. And uh, I went into officer OCS class 187 in Fort Benning to train to be a now, second lieutenant. What did they, wh why do you think they chose you to go into that? Uh, well, I guess my physical condition. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I, I was, uh, through my youth, I used to run and run and and I, I love the gung-ho thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, then, did you go through the whole course then? No. Uh, what happened, I went through the first, they eliminate, it's a 90-day wonders, you've heard that. Uh, that's right. how they come out of Fort Benning. The first, I think the first cutoff is in 30 days, and the second was in 60 days, and then if you passed that, you're okay. Uh, I went through the first and wasn't cut off. I went into the second phase and at the end of I guess 60 days I didn't keep track of it. I don't have that memory that good to remember. But I have a piece of paper in my paper uh, papers there out of a class of less than probably 200 I don't know how many was eliminated to first cut off, mm -hmm. but when I was cut off, there was 50 some men cut off at the same time I was out of that. Now the officer that addressed us at the time, informing us, told us that he was very sorry. Almost everybody was a, a, a non-commissioned corporal or sergeant, and a lot of them were higher up in the sergeants. I was a corporal at that time, and some of the men, when they heard this, cried. <laughs> some of them were so prepared, but we were actually measured for uniforms. I was measured, an uh, outfit out of Cincinnati, I forget what the name of it was. We didn't have them, but I mean, I yeah. was measured, ready to, yeah. for the manufacturer. But he told us that the graduating out of every class, the number of people that was graduated and become officers were depending on upper echelon. They had so many men, they had a surplus at one time, so they had to cut way down on who they could put out into the system. Sometimes it was so bad that they graduated practically the whole class of them. So this is something that I didn't cry, but uh, I saw some of them. Yeah. It was so set on being an officer. 
So where did they? Where did you end up after that? Okay, this is the important part in my life. I uh, was sent, and uh, in my paper, I has shows where I was. Sent. I was sent to uh, Pennsylvania, Shenango Personnel Replacement Depot. This is where they grouped a lot of people for future. Uh, they, uh, by the way, uh, in this paper, they sent a lot of them to California for the Pacific and several bases all over. I, I just happened to be in a group that went up to Pennsylvania. This is uh, not too many miles from Youngstown. Mm -hmm. So I was sent up there and held, and we were in a holding position to see what they wanted to do with us. So one day, Sunday, and that was on March the 7th. I went in, I was going to a little town nearby, but one of the guys told me, let's go to Youngstown because that's a bigger city and we can have more fun there. I said, okay, so you probably know what happened to me in Youngstown. <laughs> I went to a YMCA to swim. And this fellow was with, he went on his own, but I was going to YMCA because I wanted to swim. It was winter time, and I thought I was going to swim. So I went in and sat down in the lounge, and first thing you know, here come a bunch of women and girls. Went to the piano, and some of them come around getting the guys who were in the YMCA to come and sing. So I didn't want to sing. Well, come on, you'll feel better. Okay, I'll go. Well, I went there, and among the girls was one special. <laughs> I saw her, and she saw me, and I don't know where she had the same feeling that I did, but that's where I met my wife. And what, now, what, what's her name? <laughs> Margaret Mary Hudzik, yeah. one of the most beautiful girls in the world. <laughs> but I saw her and I immediately fell in love with her. And she took me home to meet her parents that day. She had to call them first, so I did get to meet the parents. A wonderful Czechoslovakian family. And I've appreciated them all my life. Uh, that was something very different for you, I yes, it was. growing up in Portugal. I Later on, I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I met the girl I'm going to marry. So while I was in Shenango, I went in and see Marge, and we went to a movie. We had... Uh, just talking, and I spent most of my time at the house with the family. But uh, first thing you know, uh, I was shipped out. So I went to Fort Dix, Cal uh, New Jersey, mm -hmm. which was near the docks in New York, I guess. And I was there for a period of time until I boarded the Queen Elizabeth, and as I understand it, there was 17,000 people on this ship that took five days to go across. We were unescorted, no escort ships, because we were capable of dodging the submarines. Uh, we were packed in like sardines, one cabin that was meant for a couple. I would venture to say there was probably 15 or 20 bunks, which we had to squeeze in between with the barracks bag, and it wasn't very good living conditions. Eating facilities was long lines, and of course, uh, in the process of going over, we felt jerks in the ship, and we were told the next day, or the rumors around, that we were dodging submarines. <laughs> They had to change course pretty quick. Uh -huh. 
but we made it over in five days. Where did you land? We landed up in uh, Scotland, Glasgow. Now you told me that somehow you ended up with the Army Rangers. Yeah, that was later on. How did that happen? <clears throat> well, from Glasgow we were shipped down to southern England to a little town, near a little town, called Launceston. It was in Cornwall. And uh, we were training, amphibious training, mostly. We had artillery training <clears throat> on a range. We were in all infantry. I was in an all infantry outfit. But we were training amphibious. Uh, we landed in our, almost all of our different kind of American landing craft and some British. And uh, <clears throat> one day they were asking if we wanted to volunteer to go into Rangers. That's what I w went for. I was wanting a little more adventure. Okay. So what they had to do, I could not go in the Rangers as a corporal. So I had to go back to a PFC to get into the Rangers. So I gave up my corporal's rating there. I never did get it back. Hmm. But uh, I ended up, it's on my discharge that I was, uh, my highest rating was a corporal. I was a squad leader, and uh, when I had my corporal's rating in my <clears throat> Company F, 115th Regiment, 2nd Battalion, in the 29th Infantry Division. This was a division from Maryland, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, Virginia, right in that area, National Guard outfit. So that's when I went south to join in Cornwall at a little camp outside of Launceston. So I volunteered to go into Rangers and I went in with a boy, a man, one, the two of us joined the Rangers. This is the 29th Ranger Battalion and it's, a, it's in my Ranger, it's on the video that uh, my niece, Mary Carroll, mm -hmm. found it, and it's listed right there in the Ranger, all the Ranger outfits were there, and the 29th was there, so it was a legal Ranger organization. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see, uh, Martin Eisenberg from Flatwood, New York, a wonderful Jewish boy, and he and I were very close. I had several fellows I was very close with in the, in the service. Mm -hmm. They were non-coms and just like I was. Martin was killed during the war. One of my other friends, Corporal Ansel West from Georgia, was killed. They're listed in the back of my regimental book, uh, among other. Now, were you in a, uh, a fight with them, no, uh, uh, a battle? Or? Well, this comes later on. Okay. Uh, when we, I joined the Rangers, I went to a little town called Bude <clears throat> on the east coast of, or west coast of England. And that's where my Ranger battalion was stationed. We had, we went in intensive care and cliff scaling and force marches and techniques of fighting, manual, personal fighting and so forth. We were shipped up to northern Scotland to a little port called Oban, O-B-A-N. We went out of the little port on a tramp steamer to Quentin Roosevelt and went to the secret commando base. There we stayed and trained for, I don't know how long, several months. And we were going to invade Norway on a strike and uh, rangers went in and, and uh, demolition, mm -hmm. capture prisoners, bring them out. We never got to that. Uh, orders came down, I forget the date of it, <clears throat> that the men who were going in on the invasion of France 
the rangers were coming from the states. So we had to go back to our original companies. So I don't know what the time lapse there, but we went back and I spent the rest of my time with my company. And we train harder now in different boats, assault boats and landings with uh, uh, the training in uh, my commando. I'll go back and say in the commando training, we we made a lot of night landings. <clears throat> we were aboard the ship. I lived in a castle on the side of a mountain, my company. Uh -huh. And we went through extensive training, uh, mountain climbing. Uh, this was this when was, you were back in your company? No, this is while I was still in the Rangers. In the Rangers. I'm, I'm, make, I'm okay. going, jumping okay. back and forth. Okay. But I just wanted that yeah. knowledge in there. We, I, we had uh, ropes across the valley and the mountains <clears throat> that we crawled across with equipment. So we, up until this time, you had not really seen any combat? No. No, no we're preparing for yeah, that. Right. And we were, I was going as a ranger at the time, and it was pretty, pretty extensive training. But we had uh, death slides, which was rope from one side of a mountain down to the other. And uh, you, we had toggle ropes, which went under our armpits, mm -hmm. around our back and up. Uh, <clears throat> the toggle boat uh, ropes had a loop on one end and a piece of wood and the other about six inches long. These hooked together in our mountain work in cliff scaling because you could hook the wooden hook into your partner's loop. Okay. So it made a continuous thing with a lot of men. You could go right on with it. But anyway, we would, on the death slide, we would take the rope and go under our arms and lock it in. We lock the loop into our own and grab the rope. We put it over the rope, which is slide down, <clears throat> and you re uh, regulated your speed by squeezing your rope. And it was steep and it went fast, very fast. <laughs> so. But uh, you landed on the other side of the ravine, and we had several guys that broke their leg. So forth. that's how the speed, you just had to grab it, you had to squeeze to go down. This is all preparing for actual commando work. Right. We were trained with commandos. Right. They, they were, uh, we uh, had night landings off the ship, the Quentin Roosevelt. They would be uh, anywhere after midnight in the morning hours, blackface. <clears throat> We go over the side of the ship and get in very small boats, which had very quiet motors. Then we would go in to the shore, real quiet, like, and we would go over the side. They had a pointed bow, and we would go over the rifle in one arm, one hand, and hold on to the ship in the other as we landed. Well. On several occasions, they had live ammunition flying over our head uh, as we landed. So, um, when was the first time you saw combat? Okay, I went back to my outfit and spent the rest of the times there. And uh, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time on the moors, the English moors. Mm -hmm. We slept on the moors with water underneath of us and flowing water. <laughs> they were miserable. Some of the men said, I'll be glad when we get in combat. I don't like this at all. I'll be glad to get away from the moors. Rain into the mess kits. You couldn't get to the end of the food line without water being into your mess kits with the food. And it was really, you were wet all the time. The only way you dried out was your body heat and you didn't completely dry out. So it was miserable on the moors. As we traveled through uh, going to the moors and back and everything, we saw builds up of supplies. 
ammunition and so forth. We knew we were getting closer. One day they told us we went closer to the <clears throat> coastline. We went into a uh, tents. We were told we could not go out or nobody could come in. <clears throat> we studied uh, land, uh, sand mock-ups of the coast of France from photos. They knew, we knew exactly where we were going to land. We landed near St. Laurent, sur Mer. That was our first village. And we knew exactly where we were going to land. But it ended up that nobody landed where they were supposed to. We were all shifted. I think it was north. This is in the books that uh, everybody was off course. And it threw a little confusion for a while. Now, is this the invasion of Normandy you're yeah. speaking of? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this would be what year? 19... 19... Uh, <laughs> that was June the, four, uh, the 6th, 1944. Okay. Uh, we were almost, I boarded an LCI, Landing Craft Infantry. There was approximately 200 men aboard. This was in the cramp thing too. Uh, I was aboard the ship uh, approximately a week as I remember. I, I lost time there. Did, did they tell you what you were going to be doing? Well, according to the, uh, I carried a bazooka. I must go back and tell you this. As we boarded the ship, we were concerned. They told us, you may be kicked right back off of the beach into the water, and you, you may not, you know, you, they didn't guarantee a landing. Mm -hmm. So they prepared for gas. So I had a gas mask which was a newer modern gas mask on, in front. The old ones were in the side pack here. But uh, to prepare for gas, which they didn't know where they were going to use it or not, mm -hmm. the Germans would use it, we had impregnated clothing <clears throat> dipped in chemicals, which was very stiff and sticky and everything else. I was suited up with this, and so was everybody else. <clears throat> now, well, what did that do? What? That's repel the gas. Oh, okay. Impregnated, which wouldn't let the gas hit your body and burn you and so forth. So I imagine heading into this operation, you were pretty apprehensive. Well, um, I was. I was never. I was. I will tell you, I was never afraid, or never scared. Now, that's not true with a lot of them, mm -hmm. but we had to go. This was a job. We were putting, uh, people don't realize that when you, you go, you're putting your life up. You're giving your life to your country mm -hmm. right there by going on. You know when you're going combat like this that any time a sniper bullet or a piece of mortar shell or whatever else is going to tear your body apart. Yeah. So. This is why they tell you to appreciate the veterans yeah. for giving their life on the front line. Right. This is we were front line people. We, we were going to fight right. face to face. Mm -hmm. The impregnated clothing consisted of treated long socks, long underwear, OD, which is flannel, so to speak, that's your olive drab, mm -hmm. not summer equipment. Leggings, which were also treated, the hook leggings. Your clothing, uh, your top, your shirt, a field jacket. That's the way we went in. It wasn't cold, it was June. Yeah. And so it wasn't cold, but you had to prepare for it. Everything was chemically treated. <clears throat> so then what, what happened with your outfit? Well, uh, we landed at 10 o'clock in the morning with our LCI and numerous other LCIs. 
going in. Fortunately, the engineers preceded us and opened up a lot of the obstacles. And this was up to the Navy to try to go in. We went in on high tide. So they were submerged. Where Do you know where you were at that point? You well, landed? we didn't know that we were off course. Uh -huh. We knew that uh, St. Laurent was our first objective. Mm -hmm. It so happened we weren't too far from St. Laurent mm -hmm. when we landed. We landed on a beach that was open about uh, maybe 20 feet, I imagine at the most, and then it went up semi, it wasn't cliffs, but it was a uh, <clears throat> pretty steep angle, but mm -hmm. not really. Mm -hmm. And that went up, uh, I don't know how many yards I could say, but it was fully loaded with barbed wire, with landmines. It took us a while when we hit the beach to organize because we had lost men in the water. Some of the men didn't make it out of the water. I landed up in my armpits and I was pretty tall mm -hmm. and I was loaded. I had yeah. uh, my M1 rifle, bandoliers of M1, my rifle, rifle by the way, all weapons were enclosed with plastic. They were plastic covered so the salt water wouldn't get on them. I had a bazooka and a pack of, I think, six rounds of bazooka ammunition, plus my M1 rifle, plus bandoliers of ammunition. And were, were the Germans there shooting at you all this time? They, uh, the, Navy, the shoreline had been bombarded by naval and airstrikes, but the Germans were still there. They were embedded. Uh, I did not see a pillbox, but they were firing from the top. Artillery, German artillery, was coming and landing all the time as we went in. Uh, my ship, I didn't know this, but I read it in my a naval, uh, in my <clears throat> 29th Division paper. Yeah, I have two different articles by the commander of my ship and the commander of the fleet of LCIs. My ship was hit three direct hits while it was there, right after we got off. We got off and none of our men was hit, but our ship was three direct hits and it was disabled. They had to tow it out eventually. It couldn't be on its own anymore. So. <clears throat> we got up off the beach as soon as we could, to, like I say, to get organized and to get going. Our company commander was wounded right away. He had a captain, Kaiser, so he was out. <clears throat> we got to the top and on the way up, I've stated this before and it's in the books there, one of my fellow from the squad was over to the side. We didn't go in single file. It was too all confusion. We just had to get up, get up, get off the beach because more was coming in. <clears throat> so one of them very near me hit a mine and blew. I watched his foot and shoe go by me and I started over to him and the medic behind me told me to keep on going. So I couldn't help him there and went up. So we got up to the level top. When we were there, there were just trenches all over the place connected where they could fire and then retreat, go back. Mm -hmm. So when we got up to close, they went back. <clears throat> One of my friends, close friends, this is my first firing at an enemy. Right. Uh, everybody, whoever was there started to hit, a German jumped up and started to run. 
and a friend of mine, Ralph Alls, had a telescopic sight on his rifle. And he said, let me, let me have this. Okay, so he got the guy right there with him. But from then on, it was confusing because we had fire, we advanced towards St. Laurent. And I remember the first night in St. Laurent, we uh, on the outskirts <clears throat> before dark, our artillery uh, liaison officer was up in a tree observing for his future. And I watched him fall, he, a sniper hit him, and I watched him fall and hit the limbs as he went down. It looked like a toy. He'd flip over and flip over, hit another limb until he hit the ground. Later on, there's another story I won't go into. I met his commanding officer, the general's wife, in Khan at the museum, and she, I told her that I saw this, and she says, well, that's so-and-so. So I eventually corresponded with this officer. I have a letter somewhere <laughs> corresponding with him. But anyway, this was our start of our combat. Everything else from then on was routine fighting and advancing. And uh, we had a kitchen in our company, but I never saw the kitchen. In my 11 days, we lived on C ration and K ration. K ration was canned goods, and C ration was a box, like a Cracker Jack box, with nutrition bar and <laughs> just a few things. Well, uh, I can remember as a kid, we first time uh, we went swimming with you, and I saw your leg, and you have a big scar on your leg, and I asked you what had happened, what was that, and you said you were shot in France. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this was on my last day, <clears throat> of course. This is day 11 now? Yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we had been fired on. We were going to clear out a section of where the fire was coming from. They let us get over to them. It was a mill pond and a, and a mill. A little acquainted mill with trees all around. We went through a lot of muck uh, as we got closer to it. And as we got real close, they started firing at us and they were clipping the limbs right over our head, coming down on it. This is when one of the kids went pretty much off because we thought this was the end of us. They was trapped, we were trapped on it. Well, with support, we got out of there and back. We knew where it was. So we went over to our right and entered from a different position. It's the same bunker, but it extended. This is a hedgerow. We must remember that our fighting all this time was hedgerow by hedgerow. And every hedgerow was different. You get them from three feet to probably ten feet tall. You never knew what was on the other side of each hedgerow. Usually it was a, a square. It had one entrance to it, a gate, and there's no other exit or entrance. So that was a rough fighting in the hedgerows because you never knew what was there. Uh, <clears throat> as we went over to this other position, I was out front, and we went up through a field, which is a grain field. We didn't go out in the grain field, we went along the hedgerow. And as we 
went up slowly. We were ready to fire at any minute because we were getting close to the bunker. They let my squad behind me all be exposed and all of a sudden right in front of me a man, a German, come up with a machine gun. Their machine guns was on bipods like our BAR, automatic rifles. Our uh, machine guns were more heavier and so forth, but anyways, automatic. And he shot down through my squad, and as I understood later, he hit three men down there. Well, I was so close, I think I was closer than they knew I was. I dropped automatically when he came up, dropped to the ground. Mm -hmm. And he fired and disappeared. I took aim right where he was. I take it it's the same German. And he came up again and I got him. They knew I was close then. So I was just froze there. You can't jump up and run or anything. Right. You're there. What's going to happen next? Who's going to help me? And yeah. So first thing you know, I heard a big smack, a real hard smack, and my legs started burning. My position at the time was down flat on my stomach in a firing position. My legs were spread open, and I was ready for somebody else to come up. Right. Well, they were a little bit over to the right, uh, my left, and in the same line. The only thing they could see, if we were in the wheat field, they couldn't see us. If we were down in the concealed, we couldn't see him, them, and they couldn't see us. So we had to go along the hedgerow, which was a, a path effect. Okay. So. I was in that path and somehow they come over when I was firing they had the guy that fired before was, was over to my right so I stayed there with my rifle and this guy came up and uh, could have been, and it was an automatic weapon fortunately I think one or two bullets hit me because my leg was ripped off open and my foot, one went in my foot. So I don't know if it was the same bullet or it was, uh, two bullets. So I was wounded and I knew it. And I remembered back when they told us we were in the age of sulfur drugs and sulfamalamide and sulfadiazine. And I had pills in my cartridge belt. Cartridge belt was loaded with cartridges as a rifle shell, M1 rifle. I turned over into the wheat. I was on my stomach, so I turned over on my back to get my sulfa tablets to take them. They said, if you're ever hit, take them as soon as you can. I had no sooner turned over on my back until right where I had been lying in the, in the open part, I saw the, rifle, the automatic weapon firing. I saw the dirt dig up right where my body had been. It was right by the side. So I was froze at that point. I never did take my tablets. <laughs> And I just laid there and I waited silently. I remember two concussion grenades landing nearby, which didn't affect me at all. They weren't fragment. They didn't have fragments. They were just a concussion. That's probably all they had, I guess. First thing, uh, next thing I knew, uh, a tank came up through the wheat field and started firing into the bunker. And when it was coming in, I started dragging myself down. I couldn't walk because my whole leg was laid open. Mm -hmm. 
and I started dragging myself down. And as I got down in the lower section, one of my men came and picked me up and threw me over his shoulder and carried me down into a safer area. They eventually took me at the corner. This was uh, still daylight, but it was towards late afternoon, towards evening. They put me in a corner of a hedgerow with uh, several other men. And we were still in the fighting area, mm -hmm. so I had to lay there all night. They couldn't get us out. I laid there all night. And the next morning a jeep came, piled us in, took us back a little bit, and then put us in an ambulance. So then they took us to the coast, which was, I don't know, 15 miles or, mm -hmm. I think we were close to 20 miles in. So where did they ship you to? Well, they took to a tent hospital on the okay. coast. So I laid oh. out on the ground there. Some people were lined up laying on them. And it took a while for them to get me into the tent. So that's when they stripped me and did whatever they could to get me prepared to fly out to England. Uncle Art, we just have a few minutes left here. We have about three minutes left. I wanted to uh, ask you if you, uh, how, how do you think this experience, uh, the whole military experience and, and fighting uh, in France uh, has affected your life? Well, fortunately, I came back and I didn't dwell on it. Mm -hmm. I went on about my own business. I eventually ended up, it took me a while to walk. I ended up, I played tennis. In high school, I played football, basketball. I played American Legion baseball. and I loved tennis. So I began to walk with a limp. And then the first thing you know, I wasn't limping so much. And I forgot the military. Up until the anniversary come up, mm -hmm. it was more prominent in the nation. And then I began to think, well, gee whiz, that was me. And uh, I was just one of the other many, many people who were there, and I didn't think I was a hero, or I didn't think of, I just sort of forgot about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it didn't bother me, fortunately. So uh, until the celebration of the 50th anniversary. Which you did attend, right? It, it brought back memories. Yeah. Brought back memories. Yeah. And I read my books. So I have a regimental book and a division book. And uh, I read where I was and what happened. <laughs> Up to that point, I didn't know. I was just fighting on the ground. I didn't, wasn't oriented as to villages or wherever. Mm -hmm. Was there any final comments you'd like to make before we... Well, i just uh, thankful to God for one thing, that I wasn't worse. Yeah. That's my main thing, and I'm still thankful to this day. I'll be uh, 85 next April, and I've lived with my lovely wife all that for 62 years. We have 62 years in now. This next September will make 62. So we've had many blessings. Uh, I'll always be patriotic minded. I put my flag out <laughs> every holiday. Uh -huh. I haven't been able to join. I uh, am a life member. In the we, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot about your medal. Did you? Uh... <laughs> Just well, hold that up and... Uh, is that about right? Can you hold it up a little bit? To the side. Yeah, to the side of you so we can see your face, oh, too. Yeah. You want to see whose medals they are? <laughs> well, I don't think we have time now. Okay. Uh, we're just about out of time. But uh, I want to thank you for participating in this, and uh, good luck. Thank you, Bob.